Okay, why don't we call together with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Where is everybody tonight? I guess, did the time change confuse everyone to, else too? Which is why I'm not in uniform. <laughs> I know, I thought it was much earlier in the day still. Okay, any lingering questions from the previous several chapters? Just to recap, we looked at the three different types of prayer. The first stages, the Ten Commandments, how the devil tempts us, and then we started with the antidotes against sin, which are fasting, almsgiving, and prayer, specifically the Lord's Prayer. Did we get, get an opportunity to go through the Lord's Prayer last week? I don't remember. All right, we'll, we'll start with a, a recap then of the Lord's Prayer since it was quick, and I don't know that we actually got through it. Right, we went through the anatomy of prayer, but I, at the very end, I just kind of threw prayer itself in. Okay, let's, let's, we'll start with the Our Father, and I'll go quick again, so if there's things that you want me to go deeper into, just say so, and I'll, I don't mind doing that. This one? Thank you. Is that better? Okay. All right, very good. So remember, I, I really I really like the theme of being of having audacity in prayer. That, that I think is an important part of prayer. Um, I do think in some ways, not as an absolute, but I do think in some ways it's wrong to be afraid of prayer, to be afraid of God. Acknowledging very well that fear of the Lord is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, is a gift of the Holy Spirit. But fear, fear of the Lord and being afraid are different things. I am not afraid of my father. Like my biological, I'm not afraid of Jimbo. But I do fear him. I don't fear him knowing that he's going to hurt me. I fear him knowing what his role in my life is. It, it's, to use the word fear in that way, it, it's, it's almost better, not quite, to use the word respect. Um, I don't fear my dad because I know he won't do anything to harm me. But I fear my dad in that he's my dad and I respect that authority over me. Does that make sense? Um, Okay, and I don't do this intentionally. It's been pointed out to me several times that I do it, um, but I, don't, I, I honestly do not think about this at Mass. But then I do it, and then someone else points it out to me, and I think about it again. It was pointed out to me just this week, so it's in my head again. I punch the word dare. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think about it. It just happens. <laughs> it's not intentional. Um, but there is an audacity that, that is involved in our daring to call God Father. Um, 
some people critique, you know, some people have told me that I have bad theology because I punch that word too hard, and others think it's beautiful. Who cares? I do what I do. Some people love it. Some people hate it. It's fine. Um, but as a funny aside, um, J.D. Flynn, who just did our retreat, and I, we don't have the same liturgical preferences. He prefers more of the contemporary kind of music and life teen youth mass kind of thing. I, I prefer the organ. It's fine. It doesn't matter. Um, so we were at dinner Saturday evening after the retreat day was over. And he said, Father, there's something about your, uh, what word did he use? Something about, he didn't say this, but something about the way that you say mass, but he used a different word. Something about the way you say mass that really stands out to me, and I really like it. And I said, oh, what, what is that? Knowing that he probably did not like the, the organ as much as I do, but whatever. He said, I got to see you say mass twice, and both times you punched dare hard. <laughs> And I like it. We should punch dare hard because we do dare. To, it is an audacity kind of a thing. We, we're audacious enough. Um, like, like the gospel reading just today. You know, they, Jesus calls God Father and the reaction of all of those around him is to want to stone him because he dared call God Father, which puts them on, on level footing, which makes God relatable. So when we say at Mass, we dare to call, you know, at the Savior's command and form a divine teaching, we dare to say, we, we, there is something to it. We, we aren't just casually saying, hey, Dad. We're daring to say it to God, <laughs> which was something radical when Jesus walked on. I guess it's not radical today because we've been doing it for 2,000 years, or almost 2,000 years. Um, so there's that, but that also, why do we use, why do we have to use British English? That drives me crazy. The, the Aramaic word that Jesus would have spoken was Abba. Abba, not the band. <laughs> Abba does not translate father. It translates Daddy. It, it's not a term of formality. It's a word of familiarity. Uh, the, the connotation of saying Abba um, is like a, a child with his arms up, Daddy. So the idea of saying to God, Hey, Daddy, it's weird. It's meant to be weird. It's meant to catch me off guard when I pray because it shouldn't, I don't know, there, there should be this growth into being able to say daddy that perhaps is not natural, but it becomes natural as I grow closer to God. I'm a 32-year-old man. I do not call my father daddy. In fact, most of the time I call him Jimbo. <laughs> um, or dad. But there, so there's something strange about it. But there's also something beautiful about it, that I call God Daddy because my relationship to him is not as an adult child to my father. It's a child to my father. Just as Jesus reminds us, the childlike inherit the kingdom. To those such as this child belongs the kingdom of God. To inherit it, you become an heir of the father. Right? By baptism, we are grafted onto the body of Christ. We become the Son of God, grafted onto the Son of God. Um, or like in J.D.'s first talk, when he was talking about his son who has Downs, you know, he always has to say, hey, Dad, help. If we could develop that relationship with God, that it's not, Father, I need this, I'm going to say this novena, and you're going to, I'm going to earn this by the ver merits of my prayers, and... And I'm going to have this relationship to you. And if you give me this, I'll give you this. And it becomes transactional and, and overly formal. There's a place for formality. You should kneel in the presence of God. You should genuflect. You should make right, all those sorts of things. But then at the core of my relationship with him is my heart, not my right knee on the floor. The right knee leads my heart to him. It doesn't, my relationship with God does not stop at my right knee on the floor. It begins. 
My right knee on the floor leads my heart to the Father's hand, to Daddy's hand. Click, track. Okay. Our Father who art in heaven, you know, God is, is completely other, right? To say he's in heaven, and there's that old English again, who art in heaven, you know, th this means he's completely separate. Right? He's completely distant. But this also, to be separate and set apart is what the word holy means. So if I say, who art in heaven, you're completely other than me. You're, you're, you're outside of creation. You're something greater than anything here. You're, you're other. You're holy. But he's also intimate. And there's that, that, that formal but intimate. There's that distant but near. Right? Hallowed be thy name again. Hallowed, like all Hallows Eve. Hallowed just means holy. Holy, set apart is your name. Again, there's the second command. Here's the first and second commandment, by the way, right? You see that played out. Daddy, who is in heaven, your name's holy. God, God alone, holy. Keep your name holy. Right? When I, so when I pray, hallowed be thy name in the our Father, I am making the promise to keep his name holy and asking him to give the grace to make it holy everywhere else. So to, to use God's name in vain is to violate the prayer that we say every day. Good? Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Praying that God's kingdom is actually established, not just something that we hope for, but something that, that we meet in the here and now, that God's order um, reigns now, not later, but now. Um, thy will be done. Again, same, it's a related prayer. Asking that God's will becomes my will. There's, there's a piece of surrender in that. How, uh, sorry. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And again, there's that mirror that, yes, you're, hot, you're entirely other, but you're also incredibly close. And, and the way that we draw closer to God is that his will is accomplished here just as it is there. And we draw closer to God through the will of God. Give us this day our daily bread. Terrible. I don't understand where we get daily from. Because it, it's super uzia. Super above and beyond. Uzia would be like substance. So beyond material, beyond substance. Give us this day our super Uzia bread. It's the Eucharist. Give us today the nourishment that is you that sustains us into eternity. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Begging God's mercy and forgiveness, knowing that I don't deserve it, with the consequence that because I have experienced God's mercy, I must now offer God's mercy. Because he is liberal to me, I am liberal to you. Because I am liberal to you, you are liberal to others. And the love of God, the mercy of God, is meant to spill. It's not meant to just, okay, God was merciful with me, I'm done. It's meant to spill and to continue into creation. Um, Lead us not into temptation. Remember a few weeks ago I gave that homily about the test. Pray that you do not enter into the test. What is the test? That I love God, not just the things of God. That I love God, not just his creation. So, lead us not into temptation. Maybe a little better translate, lead us not into the test. Just as he told the apostles, stay awake and pray that you may not enter the test. That, that, that's the prayer in the Our Father. And then finally, um, and deliver us, but deliver us from evil. Better translation would be evil one. Right? Deliver us from the devil, from Satan. Okay. Questions? I think we did do it last week. I just went really quickly. Nothing? All right. This next section, we're going to do five chapters tonight. Um, we're going to go... I, I don't have a ton to say. I mean, the book...
covers this part very well. Um, so my hope is that we have a more in-depth conversation. This becomes more of a discussion than anything, okay? So let's see what, what happens here. All right. So the seven sins, the seven deadly sins, anybody know them off the top of your head? I ever remember them? You, want, you can do them, Beth? I heard them last night. You did hear them last night. Let's see, let's see how far you can get. Okay, you have um, uh, sloth. Oh, you're starting at the bottom. Okay. Sloth. No, wait, 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 wait. Let's, let's stop for a second. Because there is a difference. This is sloth. This is sloth. This is a sin. This is a two- or three-fingered creature. They're spelled the same way. The sin is sloth. The animal is sloth. By the way, if it has three toes, you can't have it as a pet because it'll kill you. But if it has two toes, you can have it. I know these things. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Beth. Pride. Pride, that's number one. That's the king. Envy. Envy is number two, good. I forget what number that is. Okay. It's six. Right. Greed. What number is that? Lust. Lust is uh, in there. And, uh, anger. 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 Anger is three, isn't it? Anger. You got them. Okay. Just not in order. One, two. That's okay. I, I knew matter? him before he said last night, but not in order. What's that? <laughs> Does it matter? I mean, I know pride is the number one, but in the rest of them, do you have to? Like the commandments where they go from worst to least, or it's not worst to least, but it is kind of a um, everything leads to pride or comes from pride, but envy is most closely related to pride because envy says that I'm so great that I need what you have and I'm willing to take it from you. Uh, anger comes from envy. Right? A anger is the natural consequence or the, the brother sin to envy because if you have what I want, I'm going to be angry with you. Um, we can break this out a little bit further later, but avarice or greed, I need more, I need more, I need more, becomes lust, I need more in a different way, becomes gluttony, the more I get, the more I consume, becomes sloth, it's all about which goes all the way back. You know, so the, the, the order does not matter. Yeah, I never really but it does kind of, just insofar as they flow from one to the other. Um, and if you struggle with one, you probably struggle with the ones around it because they're so closely, or you use it as like um, a caution light. So if I know that I struggle with envy, then I know to watch my temper because I know that's going to be related to my envy. So it's just it's a, knowing how they're related can help guard against the development of sin. Um, another way of thinking about it, um, Teresa of Avila writes um, the interior castle, right? The interior castle she defines the interior castle is kind of the her analogy for your soul, and that God is found not outside of me but in my core. Actually, let's stay with this tangent, for I like this. This is going to be good, going to a good place. So God is not found outside of me. He's found in my center. He's found in my core, C-O-R, heart. So the, the, the person who begins the, the spiritual life, maybe we should do this, the interior castle as our next book study. That'd be really cool. Um, but the person, as they begin... The interior life, she says they're on the, on the outside gardens of the castle. And the person in the gardens jumps from one mortal sin to another. But the further you get into the castle, okay, maybe now you only have two mortal sins, but they're always the same. Like, I'm not jumping around. If, if, I'm, if it's anger, I'm just, that's, the, that's my sin. I'm not going to be full of love. Anger is my sin. Um, and then as you move towards God in the interior of the castle, you let go of 
your mortal sins until you just have venial sins until you don't have venial sins in your whole. Mm. And have you ever seen the movie Bedazzled? Bedazzled? Uh, Never even heard of it. What, what is it? It's it's um, it's Dudley Moore and um, another British guy that was real tall. He, they play the different parts. Okay. Uh, but it's it based on the interior castle? No, based on... Um, oh, based on the Seven, seven Deadly Sins. Sins. Oh, that's kind of cool. Bedazzle. I might have to look it up. Um, so anyway, so the idea is, as I'm progressing in the spiritual life, I'm paying attention to my inclination towards sin. And if I'm stuck jumping from one sin to another, which many of us are, um, knowing how the sins relate to one another, to one another can help. So if I know that if, if anger is my sin, I can begin to chisel away at it by taking care of envy. Right? What is it that, that, that makes me angry? Right? Is it um, like I'm disrespected? Well, why does being disrespected make me so angry? Is it perhaps I'm envious of how others are treated? And my anger is going to force me to get what I want out of envy? Does that make sense? So the sins will help me understand. How I sin helps me understand how to fight my sin. Okay. <coughs> what is the original sin of Adam and Eve? Is it? Well, temptation is never sin. It's pride, yes, but look at how it's played out. It's disobedience. And how does the ancient serpent get them to be disobedient? You're going to be like God if you eat this apple. Even before that, yes, but before that, there's a, there's a preamble that he ha that he gives. Did God really tell you that you cannot have any fruit in this garden? So he's going to twist the lie. He's going to twist the truth. He never just outright lies. He twists what's true. What did God actually say? You may not have this pomegranate. Or the pomegranates of this tree. Which tree is it? The tree of the knowledge of the good and evil. The tree of life is the one next to it. The tree of life sits here. The knowledge of good and evil sits here. They have not yet eaten from the tree of life. They eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then God casts them out before they can eat from the tree of life and become immortal. We'll get there in a second. But So the devil says, did God really tell you that? He's picking up on a couple of things. Did God really tell you you can have nothing in this garden? But... Did God really tell you that you could have nothing in this garden? Envy. Well, envy actually is played out when he says, he knows that you will not die, but that rather you would be made like him. Being made like him, envy of his ability to determine between good and evil, Becoming gods yourself. Right. You can also add in there a little bit of lust. Seeing that it's good for the eye. Right? Lusting after it. Uh, you can also put greed or avarice in it. Why? Because... Well, God said you can have everything except this one thing. Well, everything else isn't enough for me. I'm going to take the one last thing. Right? Sloth and anger, I guess, aren't really in there, but you see the point. In this one sin, five of the deadly sins are present. 
But then you look at, all right, so they, they take the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what does it say happens? What does Genesis say happens when, when they bite into the fruit? The pomegranate. By the way, you know why it's not an apple? Apples don't grow in Jerusalem. You know where apple came from? An Italian Renaissance painter. <laughs> the Renaissance is where the apple came from. The, the, the scripture actually says fruit. But there's, there's reason why it's a pomegranate. First of all, pomegranates are abundant in Jerusalem, which is where the promise, which is where the Garden of Eden was. It's actually at the place of the Dome of the Rock, which the Muslims have right now. It's, at, it's the place of the Temple Mount where the, the altar of the Temple had to be. That's the Garden of Eden. It's, it's there. Well, it's buried under a mosque at the moment, but it, it's there. Um, a pomegranate also is an ancient symbol of female fertility. And to take fertility to yourself is to have power <coughs> over life and death. To take fertility to yourself is to become God. Because that's who God is. He's creator. Right? And so the, the, the ancient pomegranate is the symbol of that original sin of trying to become God. Um, an apple is just some Italian Renaissance painter. Or a great Americanism of it. Apples aren't even American. It's your stuff. What's that? Apple, it's your stuff. That's what everybody. <laughs> I know. We've been oh, yeah. stuck on it since it was painted. <laughs> or like the image of Mary crushing the head of the serpent, what's in the serpent's mouth? An apple. It's supposed to be a pomegranate. <laughs> anyway, okay. So after they sin, it says that they bit into the, the fruit. And immediately what happens? <laughs> Their eyes were open to a what? They're <laughs> naked. To nakedness. It's not like they weren't naked before. No. They were naked. They didn't care they were naked. It didn't matter. My dog has no idea that he's naked. <laughs> and it's fine. Nobody's offended at Duke not wearing underwear. It would be kind of strange. Right? If I put underwear on my dog, you would look at me like I'm insane. If I put underwear on myself, and you'll look at me like I'm insane. So what's the difference? What's the difference? So, why are their eyes open to nakedness? What does that mean? There's something very significant there. Vulnerable. Vulnerable to what? Lust. Someone's lust? No, you said? Yes. Lust. They're vulnerable to someone else's lust. Their eyes are open to see that they're naked. The reason it matters is because now they're aware of what sin is because they have the knowledge of good and evil. Without the knowledge of good and evil, you don't know evil. Without knowing evil, you don't know what sin is. Without knowing what sin is, you have no concept of what someone can do to you. I'll give you an example. My sister hates, well, when she was a child, I should hate it. I should speak in the present. Past tense. She's a beautiful young woman now who has a proper healthy shape. But as a child, she had zero shame. Um, I still don't know why she did this, but like she would get Barbie dolls for Christmas and her birthday and whatever. And as soon as she would get the Barbie doll, she would rip the, the box open and then she would look at the Barbie, hold it by the feet and just kind of like three years old, just grunt at it. And then she would rip, and I mean rip, three year old ripping fabric, rip the fabric off that Barbie until that Barbie was naked. And then she would look at you, huh. <laughs> there was something in that little three-year-old girl's mind that hated clothing. <laughs> or I remember <laughs> I had to be, to be moved when I was nine. So I was maybe eight years old, seven or eight years old. My sister's four years younger, so she was three or four years old. And we, some of the neighborhood boys and I were on the front yard playing, and we had a glass storm door. And all of a sudden we hear, and I look up at Angela, is completely plastered on that glass door. <laughs> Naked. <laughs> Starfish on it. And I, being <laughs> apparently having lost my innocence already at seven or eight, ran to the door and threw my body against it so that the other boys couldn't see my sister's naked body on the glass. 
My sister is now 28 years old. She no longer walks around the house naked. Thank God. What changed? She knew sin. All of a sudden, she knew sin. There's a loss of innocence. There's a, or there's a development of reason. Um, I hesitate to tell the story on camera, but I think it's funny. I was a new priest, and at St. B, we had a housekeeper who arrived at the rectory at 4 o'clock in the morning on Tuesdays to clean. Why 4 o'clock? Things are happening at 4 o'clock that I don't want people in the house for. At 4 o'clock, I'm sleeping, and at 4.30, I'm getting up to get in the shower. Nobody needs to be in the house. And that, the, the, I lived alone. There's, Father Alex had his own rectory. I lived alone in my own house. I didn't realize she came at 4.30. Or 4 o'clock. So 4.30, I go and take a shower. The, sh the bathroom was not properly ventilated, and so I would shower the door open so that it didn't build up steam. And I get out of the shower, and she's standing in the hallway. I scream, I grab a towel, and I cover my elbow. <laughs> no, I did not cover my elbow. I covered my midsection. Why? Because that's the part that can be used by another. Nobody's going to look at my elbow like, dang. Well, at least I hope not. That'd be weird. <laughs> now, now I wish I had my cassock on so you couldn't see my elbows. But, but there's a reason that we cover up certain parts of ourselves. Because that's how we're going to be used. Or there's a reason when in certain circles sometimes we put up these fake personas. Or become gruff and distant. Because there, there's something about that person that feels like I'm going to get taken advantage of emotionally, physically, sexually, mentally, monetarily, right? And so we put up natural guards, especially if there's a person that's hurt us. We always put up a guard there. Right? Or, or I have to struggle to put that guard down and tell that story because there's a camera and who knows who on the internet is going to say whatever. Because it happens. Or I don't always speak my opinion. Because I might get attacked for what I, I like or what I prefer or what I believe to be true. So the eating of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, yeah, it makes me like God, knowing right from wrong. <coughs> but it means that I'm also aware of what you can do to hurt me. Now there's a healthy shame, right? Healthy shame dictates that I wear clothing that I don't come in here and teach book study naked. That's good. Unhealthy shame would be something that's crippled, that doesn't permit me to speak to people or to interact with people. So this introduction of sin, it cripples us. After they, their, their eyes are made open and they know right from wrong, then what happens? Cover Before the fig leaves, they hide. They hide. By the way, I, I, I've always been completely amazed and wanting to enter into the Garden of Eden because how cool would it be to be able to be like in a beautiful garden that's prepared by God Himself and hasn't become overgrown and is perfectly kept and the most delicious fruits that have never been genetically modified and and perfect scenery and the animals are well groomed and kept and everything's in harmony and then you can also hear God walking through the bushes I might have a little bit of envy of the Garden of Eden but they hear God they hear him walking and so they hide themselves and the Yahwist says and the author of Genesis says, where are you? Adam, where are you? As if God doesn't know. Adam, where are you? What does Adam say? I hid myself. Well, why did you hide yourself? Because I was naked and afraid. Well, why were you naked? Or who told you that you were naked? 
Did you eat of the fruit? What does Adam say? It wasn't me. It was that woman that you put here. It was that woman that you put here. We have the second sin. Sin snowballs. We already have the second sin. What's the second sin? Lying. Lying. Blaming someone else. And breaking the first commandment. Because he now is blaming God for sin. It's that woman. That's not the important part. I know women are always going to hear that first. But that's not the important part. The important part is that you put here. I was fine on my own. And then you had to take my rib out and make another and, and make this beautiful thing next to me. And then she made me do it. It's your fault, God. Could have just left me on my own. And you see how sin snowballs even further. Okay. Questions about that? About anything, any of those things so far? <laughs> sin interrupts and blocks the relationship with God. That's kind of the whole point of the story. It interferes with our ability to hear God rustling in the, in, in the garden. We get cast out of paradise. We can go through Genesis 3, but do it on your own. Go through Genesis, Genesis 3. Genesis 3. And read the curse. Because God curses Adam and Eve. And Satan. And creation. But don't read it as God punishing. It's not God is enacting the curse. God is speaking the curse that we enacted on ourselves. God is articulating the, the, the consequence, not the punishment, but the consequence of their sin. Okay? So go read Genesis 3 about the consequences of sin. But let's do the first four sins here. Um, little thought experiment. Everybody, right now, imagine, funny anecdote, okay, so the first, uh, when I got the COVID shot, I reacted to all the shots that I got with very high fever. Terrible, terrible. Um, I got my second shot on Mardi Gras day. Ash Wednesday, I had three masses. Two in the morning, 6.30, 8 o'clock, and 6.30 p.m. I had 100, I woke up with like 100 degree fever and it climbed all day. So 6.30 mass, I'm fasting, it's Ash Wednesday. I go to say mass, I have 104 degree fever when mass starts. And I get up to preach. I have no idea what I said. I, have, I had no idea where I was. And I remember standing at the Ambo at St. John, and I watched this pink elephant come down the center <laughs> aisle. And I remember standing at the, at the Ambo going, Nicholas, do not talk about that elephant. <laughs> it's not there. It is the fever. And I have no idea what I preached, and no one will tell me what I preached. <laughs> okay, so now that everybody has the pink elephant walking down the aisle of the church in your mind, stop thinking about the white elephant. Or the pink elephant. Can you stop them at the pink elephant? Look, the pink elephant's right here. He's standing right here on this on this um, podium. The pink elephant's standing right here. You see him? All right, now stop thinking about the pink elephant. Can you stop thinking about the pink elephant while I'm talking about the pink elephant that's right here? Can you stop talking about the pink elephant? Can you, can you get it out of your head? Same thing with sin. If I struggle with anger, and all I can think about is the last thing that someone did to make me angry. And I keep saying, I'm not going to be angry at that person anymore. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to be angry about the situation, but they did this, 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 and this. I'm not going to be angry, but I'm going to think about this. And I'm going to go tell Brandon. I'm going to go tell Karen. And I'm going to go tell everybody about this thing that this person did to me that made me so angry. And I can't stop thinking about it, but I'm going to tell everybody. And I'm going to dwell on it, but I'm not, I'm not going to be angry anymore. Good luck. Or someone that struggles with lust. I'm not going to think about sex. Yeah, go ahead. Stop. You still think about it? There's got to be a different way. I'm just saying I'm not going to sin. What's the different way? Anybody? Chastity. Well, okay, but chastity. I'm going to be virtuous. 
We're, we're only doing the first four. <laughs> yeah, you have to become virtuous, right? I, you don't just stop lusting, you build the virtue. You don't just stop being proud, you build a virtue. So each one will have an antidotal uh, virtue. What's the antidote for pride? Humility. humility. How do I obtain humility? <coughs> what is the best exercise to build up humility? Learn your nature. What's that? Kneel down and pray. Well, I don't know. Maybe there's something stronger than just kneeling down and praying. Now, I don't want to poo-poo prayer, but... <coughs> yeah, you cheat. I feel like cheating. I do the same thing with the youth group, by the way. So but, they, but that's I don't think, pretty casual. I, I don't think this is right, but I, it's what I was going to say last night when the child said it first. What? Obedience. That is right. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was thinking you had said something more than that. <laughs> You're so smart. Becoming obedient leads to humility. I, would, I heard this last night. <laughs> right? It, Some of it. Looking at someone who has authority over me, even if I disagree with them, and say, okay, if that's what you want, that's what I do. And then not complaining about it, right? I'm not, not the letter of obedience, but the spirit of obedience, right? If the archbishop told me to do something and I went and told everybody that the bishop told me to do this and I'm doing it only because he told me to do it and I don't want to do it, that's not really obedient. I mean, it is, but it's not. I'm undermining my own obedience. It's certainly not humble. Certainly not humble. Actually, it's kind of arrogant. Right? If I go around saying the bishop said that I have to wear New Balance, and I'm only wearing New Balance because the bishop said I have to wear it, but I don't like New Balance. I want to wear Nike, but I'm doing it because the bishop said it. I'm just making the bishop look like a butt. Well, you try to make the bishop look like a butt, but if you're smart enough, you recognize I'm the butt. <laughs> right okay um, obedience is a powerful powerful spiritual action um, it's one of the hardest as a priest I promised prayer obedience and chastity according to my celibate state which one do you think people always assume is the hardest chastity yes. yes. I've not violated that promise. <laughs> kind of easy, I think. The hardest part of celibacy is going home to an empty house. Sometimes. Most of the time, it's a blessing. <laughs> the hardest promise is not prayer. You just do it. It's obedience. The three times that I was called on obedience were the three hardest moments of my priesthood. My three assignments. Right? I did not want to leave St. Bede to go to Magnolia Springs. And after three years there, I had renovated the church and brought about community and started all these things. And they loved me and I loved them and all. The awkward transitional time was over and I wasn't angry at them and they weren't angry at me. And it was just beautiful. And of course, as soon as I got comfortable at St. John, what happened? Brother Nicholas, you're going to be the pastor of St. Pius. Okay. Do I have to? <laughs> yes, you're under obedience. Okay. So I'm here. I'm not dissatisfied to be here. I like being here, but I didn't want to leave. I, I, at the very least, I didn't want to pack my things. I'd only lived there for three years and just renovated the kitchen. <laughs> Not to mention how much I love the parish, you know? <coughs> um, that's, that's hard. Uh, or the story of Padre Pio. You know, I think a lot of times, especially since 2020, you know, there, there's been several priests that have gotten in trouble national, in this country since, since the pandemic. Um, a lot of priests got in trouble for just talking too much. You know, calling out their bishops. And I'm not saying... Calling out injustice is bad. That's a virtue. That's good. Um, I don't want to name names because I don't want to get into the politics of it all. But, you know, 
we tend to think that the virtue is always to fight the authority. But that's not virtue. Virtue is, te is temperance, of knowing when to fight it, and when to just be quiet. <coughs> Padre Pio is an incredible saint because he was obedient, even when the church was wrong. Pio received, well, before he received the stigmata, Pio was known for bilocation, mm -hmm. intense preaching, and reading souls. So much so that people flocked from all over Italy and Europe to San Giovanni Rotondo, which would make Magnolia Springs or Bon Secor look like a booming metropolis. This tiny little nothing village that had the friary and nothing else. And maybe a few farms. And thousands of people flocked there to see Pio, this little poor Franciscan friar. And it scared the church. It scared the bishop. Why are all these people going to go see this really gruff priest? He, he was mean. He wasn't a very nice person. He was gruff. He was rough on the edges. Why are all these people flocking, you know, suspicious. So much so that this bishop wrote the Vatican. The Vatican silenced him, censored him, took away his faculties. You may not preach in public, you may not hear confessions, and you may not say mass publicly. So Pio went to his cell in the friary, which is bedroom, not jail cell, went to his cell and said mass privately. And people would write him letters saying how unjust it was that he was silenced. And it was unjust. But Pio remained <clears throat> obedient. He remained silent. And then the church realized that there was an error there. And so lifted the censure. And then Pio receives permission to say Mass publicly. And as he returns to the public celebration of Mass, public preaching, confessions, his bilocation, all of a sudden he receives the stigmata of Christ as a sign from God that this man is to be followed. He didn't achieve the heights of sanctity by fighting the unjust decision of the church. He reached the heights of sanctity by being obedient even when his bishop and the Vatican were wrong. What does Jesus say about authority? You have no authority over me except what, what has been given to you from above. Right? If I have authority, if you have authority, it's because God gave it to me. God gave it to you. And that is to be respected. Not because that authority is infallible, but because it's gifted by God. Right? And that, and you see now how the, the practice of obedience destroys pride. Because even if I'm right, I'm wrong. If I'm disobedient. Does that make sense? And I, I know many people struggle. I hear confessions. I listen to podcasts. I, I read blogs. Unfortunately, I'm on Facebook. <laughs> the hatred and the outright disobedience of the church is going to take souls to hell. Wishing that Francis was dead or that Rudy was retired now. I don't care if I agree with them or not. Francis is the Holy Father, and God gave him the power. Thomas Rhodey is the Bishop of Mobile until he's not the Bishop of Mobile, and not a day sooner, right? That's just the way it is. And there's so much virtue and healing and holiness that can come from humility, surrendering to that authority. Now, if your pastor or the bishop or the pope tell you to kill somebody, please don't. <laughs> right? That, that's where, uh, if, it, if the only time obedience is not good is when the, the, the matter of obedience is sin. Is it sin for P.O. to be silenced? No. No, it's a morally neutral action. Is it sin for me to become the pastor of St. Pius when I don't want to stop being the pastor of Magnolia Springs? No. 
It's not sin. So you do it. Right? Is it sin to follow the bishop's liturgical rules? No, unless he's like telling you to throw the toast on the ground or something, you know. If, unless it's sin, it must be obeyed. That's the line. Okay. Humility is not making myself small. Humility is living the truth. Right? Um, I'll tell you this little funny story. Maybe this would have had a little bit of a tinge of sin in it. But it's a good story to illustrate this point. Um, we had gone to a funeral mass. Um, Father Dan, my mother, and I. And after the mass, uh, my mom was commenting about how poor, poorly done the homily was, or at least she believed the homily to have been done. And I looked at her and I said, yeah, I could have done a much better job. She said, Nicholas, it's not very humble of you. <laughs> I just looked at her. I said, well, it's true. And then Father Dan goes, no, that's humility, because if he would have said, oh, yeah, but it's better than I could have done, he would have been lying, which is not humility. It's just, it's false humility, which is pride. Right, of saying, look at me, look how humble I am. I'm humble by it because I, I can even you know, give the credit to someone that's worse than me to say that they're better than me. That's, that's pride. It's an inverted pride, but it's pride. Um, humility is not the opposite of pride. Humility is living in the truth. Pride is usually an inflated truth. Not a falsehood. Make sense? Okay. Envy. What's the virtue? Mercy. Why is that? That right? That's an interesting one, I think. Why do you think mercy? mercy. What's that? Why do you think mercy is the one? Anybody? Anybody? Well, maybe because when you're envious, you think you deserve what you're going after. Yes. One. Whereas mercy. You don't deserve and you get it. Yeah. Get it. Um, who listened to the homily this week? What's mercy? What's mercy? <laughs> Fair enough. We listen, we don't remember. Okay. Mercy is giving to someone what they do not deserve. Envy is saying, I deserve this thing, give me. Right? I deserve. I don't know. What do I, I don't know. What do I deserve? I, whatever. I, I deserve a million dollars. You have to give me a million dollars because I deserve it. Mercy is looking at you and saying, eh, I know you don't deserve it, but here's the thing. Um, mercy undercuts envy because I'm not focusing on what I deserve. I'm focusing on what I need to give you or what I opt to give you. It puts the focus off of me and onto you. All right, and the virtue for anger? Meekness. Meekness. I love meekness. Um, meekness is not like a doormat, though. Meekness doesn't mean you can do whatever you want to me and I'll just get over it. Meekness is what is meant when Jesus says, if someone strikes you on the cheek, turn the other. Um, can I use you as a volunteer? <laughs> okay. If I, most people, 90% of the world is right-handed. If I slap Tony, what cheek do I hit? The left. What's the left cheek? In every language except for English. Worldly, right? Any, well, at least any Romance language, any Latin-based language. It's the worldly <laughs> side. Um, in Spanish, izquierda. In Italian, sinistra. Um, but it's, it's sinister, it's worldly, it's not of God. The right side, Spanish, derecha. Italian, dextra. Right, it has to do with God. So if I strike Tony on the left cheek, I've insulted him. If 
I open hand slap any man, it's really just an insult. <laughs> but if he turns the other cheek and I backhand him, there's that audacity again. It, 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 in, a, in a way, it's like saying, yes, you can insult me all you want, fine. Smack me, I don't care. Take what's God's. I dare you to take what belongs to God. That's meekness. All of a sudden, the, the phrase turn the other cheek doesn't really mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's not you just get walked on. It's, it's this audacious thing of saying, yes, you can take from me what I hold to be good. You better not take what belongs to God. Um, or if someone insults me, it's controlling my anger. Right? What is anger? When we see it, for instance, when I accidentally cut the Chick-fil-A line several months ago. I really didn't know he was in line. He was way back there. I didn't know what he was doing. I got in line. He rolled down the window and stuck the middle finger out the window and started screaming and I'm wearing a collar and I don't know how to react so I just kind of blessed him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what was I doing? Throw two middle fingers back at him. Like, yeah, yeah, you little, you know. So, anger would have dictated that like I take the, the drink in my hand and throw it at the windshield and many people will do that. Anger takes over, the situation escalates. I look at him and I'm like, all right, flip me off, but I'm just going to give you God. By the way, I'm not bragging on that. I'm so amazed that I didn't yell back at him. It was not in my character. Thank God something good happened. Um, I got to ask, what did he do? After he put his head down. <laughs> he just put his head down. He's like, <laughs> um, meekness kind of undercuts anger. It, it diffuses situations. Uh, if you become a doormat, though, you're really going to get trampled. Mm -hmm. If you respond with anger, the situation escalates. Mm -hmm. If you respond with meekness of like, okay, fine, you hurt me, but you're going to stop. It can usually diffuse the situation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So becoming more meek of not allowing things. Another way to think of being meek is to have control over your emotions instead of emotions to control over you. To not allow someone to get under your skin enough that you blow up. That's meekness. Meekness comes from knowing who I am in God's eye. I'm God's beloved son. And at the end of my life, it does not matter how many of you like me or are pleased with me. <coughs> it matters if I serve God and was obedient to him. Mm -hmm. And so if you're upset with how I live my life or the decisions I make or the way I speak, and none of it's sinful, okay, that's fine. And being able to live out of that identity as a beloved child of God is what loans itself to meekness. This is what I would say comes from prayer above all things. This comes from my relationship with God. Being me. Alright, the last little part tonight. Avarice or greed. Generosity. Generosity. Why? It's better to give than to receive. You're giving away just to receive. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, whatever. Y'all know. Generosity. <laughs> Um, You're sharing something. I'm sharing something. Uh, I I try in confession to give a penance that is um, gentle. Practical. Um, the same. Completely is, is medicine for the the illness that addresses the the thing that causes sin. I don't always succeed at finding that thing. Um, but for greed, I, I, I'm pretty confident I know which I know what to do. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'll grow, but at the moment, I'm pretty confident I know the right thing to do there. Is this. If someone confesses, oh, Father, I, I'm too materialistic. I, I shop too much. I love my car or my house or my success or whatever too much. Um, I usually will try to give a pen something along the lines of, Go find something you actually enjoy and give it away. 
and then come many times I'm met with, oh, well, I have a bunch of clothes that don't fit, so I'll give those away. I'm like, no, do that too. Go give your favorite shirt away. Go, get whatever, if you've collected too many knickknacks, go find one of your collectibles and give it away. If you're too proud of how fat your bank account is, the donation box will be, or the basket will be passed on Sunday. Make it hurt. Right? And it's not me trying to get things out of people, but, it, but it's addressing this, this spirit of greed. That to undercut my spirit of greed, I have to realize I don't need everything I have, <coughs> and to let go of it, I'm going to undercut my sinful tendency. And the more I can undercut, the more I can practice that generous spirit, the better uh, it, it becomes. Um, all right, last story of the night, and we'll close. When I was in college seminary, uh, Father Bill Bear, God rest his soul, was the rector of St. John Vianney, where I went. And um, once a semester, he would name 20 men at random from the seminary and take them to this very fancy uh, uh, Russian restaurant called Moscow Hill. And it was up on Summit Hill, right by the cathedral in St. Paul. Four-star restaurant, the time, most expensive restaurant I've ever been in. I only got to go once. My name only got picked one time. Um, he was only rector for my first year. But, uh, so we go, and I'm sitting next to Father Bear, and the check comes. And this is, I mean, we all had an appetizer. We all had an entree. We all had a dessert. 21 of us, including him, at a very expensive night at this restaurant. And the bill comes, and Father Bear goes, I can't see it. I forgot my glasses. And it was a set. I read it. It was several thousand dollars. I was like, goodness. I said, well, I was like, two thousand dollars. Not several, but my goodness. I said, for a meal? And um, he goes, you said two thousand? Uh huh. Yes, Father. And he goes, okay. And he goes, did I do this right? And I said, no. <laughs> you, you did not. You tipped a thousand dollars. He goes, yep. Threw it down and walked out. And I just was floored. And so we get back to the seminary and I'm kind of waiting in the lobby. And I walk up to say, Father Bear, um, why did you tip 50% on an already expensive bill? I, I know priests don't make a lot of money. What are you doing? And he said, every year someone gives me a bunch of money and they say it's for my retirement, but I don't need it. The church will take care of me. So I spend it on the guys. He said, now, and then in the rector's conference a few weeks later, we're all in the chapel. And he said, men, when you're priests, don't be cheap. Because everybody sees a collar coming and they run. They don't want to serve us because we're cheap. But being cheap is not the gospel. Being cheap is being a clerical pig. Do not be a clerical pig. Be generous. And to quote Matthew's Gospel, he says, Freely I have received, so freely I must give. So practicing that detachment. So just because I have it doesn't mean it's mine. What I have is not for me, but what I have is for the kingdom of God. What I have is not for my comfort or my status. What I have is to accomplish the purpose of the church, the mission of the church which is the salvation of souls. No matter if I'm priest, or teacher, or retired layperson, or garbage man, or janitor, or, or, or police officer, what I have is for the kingdom, not for me. And he said all this. And I walked up to him afterwards and I said, but Father Bear, but isn't that just imprudent? I know how much priests make. I make less than he made because he was a priest in St. Paul, Minneapolis, which has a much higher cost of living and the priests make more money. I can't imagine spending $3,000 on a meal. I only make $18,000 a year. I can eat six <laughs> times, then I starve. Yeah, I can't do that. And, I, and he only made like $35. It's 10% of his income in one meal. Now, that was not from his income. It was from gift money, but whatever principle remains, it's imprudent. And I, I called him on that, and he goes, no, it's not. Because I spent it on future priests to teach them how to live a good life. 
I said, good life because I don't mean the food they ate. I meant treating people well. So the good life is being generous to people who are in need. He said, every single time I've left this tip, the waitress come, sends me a, a letter about how much it blessed them and changed their life for that moment. I'll continue to do it because I'm changing their lives and I'm teaching you how to be generous. Being generous will destroy avarice, but it, would also, it also does this. It undercuts the spirit of entitlement. It undercuts the spirit of what does everybody else owe me? Nobody owes you anything. But you owe God everything. And if we live a spirit of generosity, we will undercut sin and we will change the world by making God present. We'll stop there, and we'll pick up with lust next week. Um, <laughs> so we are ready to word it. <laughs> any, any questions? I got to get to this meeting because we're going to start with lust. Tell my friends. Maybe we'll have a bigger crowd. <laughs> Maybe I should say it at mass. We're talking about lust on Wednesday. <laughs> any 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 final questions? Comments? Tomatoes we grow. When we were talking about the nakedness, I can relate because when I was little, I didn't like clothes. And Stay left the door open. I was outside playing in the mud with these little white cotton panties on them, you know. They didn't find me in the house, you know. But that's a child because you don't know what nakedness is. I think we're all gonna be naked. Say not me. <laughs> I'm going to look at the list yeah. of sins. You know, I think, uh, and I consider myself, all of those sins come out of a violation of the first commandment where, the, where I make myself my center of worship, yes. not God. And when all of doing is thinking about self you know you talk about like truth or understanding how you relate to God and how you relate to other people or being able to see what your teacher did when he paid such a big bill at the restaurant you can't do that if you're too wrapped up and you should be thinking about yourself mm -hmm. um, and that's just the, that's probably the biggest obstacle And that's why pride is the king. That's why every single sin is also pride. And that's why every single commandment is also the first commandment. Right? If you truly understand what it, said, what it means to say, the Lord is God, the Lord alone. You shall not have any false gods. You don't need the rest of them. You're right. Every single sin is about the worship of myself. Mm -hmm. um, there's this old English word worship which morphed into worship the thing that you worship is the thing that you put the most worth in if you actually want to worship God you plan your whole life around him if he's one of the things you do on the side, figure out what you worship and stop. Right? If you're missing Sunday Mass, well, why are you missing Sunday Mass? Well, because I'm too busy. What are you busy with? What you're busy with that's preventing you from going to Mass is what you worship. Because it's just what it is. I'm not that's a good insight. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, and I won't be able to be here next week. I'm, I'm going to be gone. But, um... Well, the camera will be here. I know. I'm glad you told me that. If I just can't get my mind onto the, I don't do a lot of the Facebook stuff. But anyway, um, when you were talking about the Adam in the garden and the, um, the sh nakedness and shame, and anyway, it's kind of hard how to put this. But I taught chastity for 25 years with two B, and part of that, when I taught, a big strong part of it was modesty mm -hmm. that we tried to teach um, for the girls, but also. 
you know, the guys that they set that standard sometimes, you know, themselves, what the girls are wearing for them a lot of times. So, but I'm just look, thinking now, you know, the Blessed Mother at Fatima, I think gave this almost a prophecy about the change in fashions and, and, and everything. And we've gone right down that, you know, that hole. And it, it just seems to me it's so difficult now because we were ashamed of our nakedness. Now it seems like we're almost getting naked again before we get to heaven. But we're getting naked for what? In order to become used. Right. That's what I'm saying. And that's what I told the girls. I said, so the way you dress as to who you attract and what's going on with, you know, because many of them are, um, you know, We've worked lost. about those kind of things. But it's just, you know, something you look at because even, I mean, I know in families, because I've been there, it is a huge battle when your daughter gets to the age of one of a bathing suit. I mean, it is a war zone. And I Thank see. Thank God I don't have to do that. Right. I mean, be, be glad <laughs> because we're fixing to face it again with grandchildren. But it's, I look at even the best of families and I see their daughters on the beach. And I think, well, the battle's lost in a lot of ways because of a culture of what's out there that you're well, fighting against. Here's what I think it comes down to with that is um, in my perception, and this is just my own thinking, it seems to me that we have been become so desperate for love. And you can go through the different generations and how every generation, going back as far as any living generation, going all the way back to the silent generation, to Gen Z, or Gen Alpha now, you can go through all the generations that are living today, and every generation has chipped away at the idea of love. Every single generation is guilty of this. And we've become so starved to be told that you're valuable even being known. And we've become lied to about what love is and where it is accessed. <clears throat> that out of this primal, and I mean primal not in a pejorative sense, but primal in a basic human sense. It's who we are as human beings. We're social. We're made for love's sake. The, the primal part of us, that desire for love, which is a good desire, has become so distorted. And we've been lied to that the commandments somehow hinder us from love. Or they make us less free. And so we, without freedom, I can't pursue the things that make me feel love. But even the feeling of love we've distorted into something that's... It's either lust or usury or... I don't know what, but and then we end up wounding each other because I'm so desperate to be loved that I'm willing to hurt you and I'm willing to hurt you and I'm willing to hurt you so that I feel loved or I feel satiated. And then by me hurting all of you, now you're hurt and you're wounded and you have this desire to be loved because I've hurt, harmed your ability to accept love and then you go out and hurt each other and it spirals and it spirals and it spirals. And then we reach a culture that rejects God because we see shame, any kind of shame, as this evil thing. Or any kind of definition of humanity as this evil thing because who are you to tell me what I am? Where freedom comes from looking at love himself and allowing love to tell me who I am. And that in telling me who I am, love tells me that he loves me. He loved me into existence. By the way, love's name is Jesus. <laughs> it's, in, it's, in, it's throughout the Gospels, but it's most specifically in the first letter of St. John. Deus Caritas Est, the name of Pope Benedict's first encyclical to the first letter to the world. God is love. And our ability to love comes from that, the fact that God himself is in us and we're made in his image and likeness. And if we can purify that, and, and identify the core of me I'm made for love's sake. There's tremendous healing and joy and freedom that can stem from that. So much that the whole cosmos can be shaken again. Um, but no, you're right. It, it's 
it's becoming worse, and it's not becoming worse because of anybody's fault. It's becoming worse because we're all wounded and we keep wounding each other. Specifically in this area of love. Specifically in the way that Adam and Eve were wounded. It, it's just a perpetuating wound. It stems from taking the pomegranate, not the apple. Anything else? I keep calling it an apple. So people. If you keep I calling it an apple, you get to straight to hell. Because it's pomegranate, it's red. Yeah, pomegranate's red, and apples, most apples, well, some apples are red. Okay. But once, <laughs> glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be, for all thou can, that he may. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Get out.